All right, gang, good morning, good morning. Glad you are here. Russ, thank you for that music. It's always great to listen to that as we work on uh, meditating and setting our intentions. So great conversation for you this morning. I am excited about this. So uh, what I wanna chat with you about this morning is really objection handling. So uh, let's just get into it. If you would, I want you to write this statement down because I think it's a very important statement to recognize. You know, I, as long as I've been in the business, because I've, I've been in real estate for nearly 30 years, and it, just saying that just blows my mind because uh, it, it doesn't seem like it. And uh, it's crazy to think that uh, I've been doing really the, you know, the same thing, being in the same uh, profession for, for that long. Uh, and it, it wasn't even, it wasn't plan A and it, it, it wasn't even a plan B and here I am doing it. So <laughs> it's crazy. But this, this particular topic is so important because real estate is all about working with people. And when you work with people, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, confrontation. There's a lot of uh, conversation. And we have, to be, um, we have to be prepared for that. We have to be ready for it. So I, here's the statement that I want you to just, I want you to write down, but listen to it first of all. The best objection handler is a great presentation. The best objection handler is a great presentation. See, what I have discovered over the years is, is I've you know, worked in coaching uh, thousands of agents in thousands of coaching sessions is as we talk about this, Agents are always concerned about, well, give me your objection handler. I want to hear, you know, the objection handler. What's the best objection handler? And I have to say, there isn't one best objection handler for any objection. There really isn't, because there are so many different objection handlers for so many different objections. It, it, the, the real issue isn't the exact words that are used. Ultimately, the issue is the confidence with which the objection handler is presented. In other words, your response, the confidence of your response. Because to prove a point, you can take a great script and you can present it in a way that is pathetic, that, that you lack absolute confidence in saying the words and the objection handler, the script's going to fail. And then you can take a mediocre objection handler, but say with absolute certainty and confidence and the listener will look at you and think, okay, I get it. It makes sense. Just simply because you presented it with confidence. So again, I say the best objection handler is a great presentation. Now well, the question is, how do you do that? Well, I think it comes down to confidence through practice and preparedness. So a question that I have for you is, do you practice your objection handlers? Do you practice your scripts? And guys and gals, if you're not, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm here to tell you that you should, because that's what professionals do. Professionals practice their scripts. And when I say scripts, fill in the blank, it could be the procedure, their protocol. You think about a doctor, for example, they practice their procedures, right? For many years before they ever work on you. And they continue to do that. They continue to go to symposiums and they continue to get guidance. And they, they're, they're trained by companies that create new uh, techniques and, and equipment for, for operations. They're consistently trained. They work on their, their presentation, their script, their protocol. It is interesting to me that real estate agents resist this and they ignore this. And I think that's the reason if you take a look at it on a national level, that the average real estate agent makes about 55,000 if they're producing and that the, uh, the poverty rate in the United States for a family of four is about $55,000. I don't think that, that there's a coincidence there. It tells me that average people are gonna do average things and live an average life. So remember this, your best chance of overcoming an objection is to give a great presentation, have a great conversation. Because in most cases, if you will present yourself with absolute confidence and with a sense of uh, certainty, knowing exactly where you're going and where you're taking people, and there's no hesitation in your response to the questions that they ask you, you're going to find yourself getting fewer and fewer objections. See, the fact is that if you find yourself getting a lot of objections in your presentations, whether it's buyers or sellers, what I would suggest to you is this, that your presentation is not as strong as it needs to be. You're leaving people with a great deal of uncertainty, with a lack of confidence in you and the situation. And so therefore, they're going to object. An objection is nothing more than a question. And a question is nothing more than uncertainty. They don't know. They want to know the answer. What is the answer? People are looking for certainty. It, look, you would not tolerate, or you would be absolutely mortified if you were in a car accident and the fire, 
department showed up and the EMT showed up and the EMT is looking at you lying there in your car and you've got multiple fractures, you're having a hard time breathing. And they look at you and they start looking through a manual saying, okay, dang it, I don't remember what they said to do in this situation, right? What's the first thing that I do? Oh yes, I've got to make certain that I secure them and especially their neck in case that there is some sort of cervical or, or, or some sort of spinal injury. Look, you wouldn't tolerate that, that would mortify you and it wouldn't be professional. We have to make certain in the business of real estate that we understand that there is a protocol, a process, that there's a script. And if we'll practice that and work on that, that is the best objection handler because a great presentation will in most cases prevent most objections for ever be, from ever being raised. So I want you to write this down. I want you to write down this statement in first person. I must be the authority. I must be the authority. See. What I want you to recognize is this, is that you are the authority. When it comes to real estate, it's you. The buyer and the seller are not authorities. You are, as much as buyers and sellers, especially in today's world, think that they know more than you and I do, they don't. Or if they do, then you need to own that. Let me say that again. If buyers and sellers know more than you do about the market, then you need to own that. That should not be happening. You should be the authority. See, if I were to ask you, for example, what is the unemployment rate in your state or what is the unemployment rate in the United States or what is the average interest rate today or what is the historical average over the course of the last several decades, would you know the answers to those questions? I believe that you should. And the reason you should is because if you know that information, oftentimes when you get objections or when people ask you your opinion on the market, you can at least give them a confident, certain answer about what you do know, not what you're speculating, not what you're guessing, because none of us know where the market's going to go, but we do know where the market has been and where it is today. And if we can speak authoritatively on that, then people will look at us as professionals, as they should, people they can trust to lead them through a process, people that they will have fewer questions of if we can answer those questions confidently. So be the authority, write that in, in, in first person. I must be the authority. So know the facts. So I wanna share some things with you here and then we're gonna work on some uh, objection handlers or some questions specifically that you might be getting in today's market or in any market and how to handle those. So. Do you know what the historical average for <clears throat> the interest rate is in the United States? If, if somebody does, just uh, type it in the chat box. And don't look it up. Don't, don't do that. Just take a guess. And, and my suspicion is that many of you know. But just somebody put in the chat box uh, a guess. I'm not going to give you the answer until somebody does. And so we're taking way too long to come up with the answer, which tells me see, people are looking it up. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Are you there? Okay, thank you, Dominique. At least thank you for participating. And Dan, thank you. So I saw 6%, Dan saying between 7 and 8%. Yeah, the answer is 8%. Historically, in the United States, the average for the interest rate is 8%. Now, my question for you is this. Do you know what the lowest rate has been historically and what the highest rate has been historically? And the only reason this is relevant is because as an authority in the business of real estate, you should know these things because it gives you perspective. And if you have perspective on the way things have been historically, then you know more about what the, the numbers mean today and you can give people perspective. See, if, if I told you, for example, the historical average for the interest rate is 8%, but I didn't share with you or didn't know what the interest rate is today, that wouldn't be as valuable, right? So somebody wrote in here, uh, lowest now, highest. Uh, what was the highest then again? Let's see. Let me look that up. Bear with me as I go into the chat line. Uh, highest 18%. Yes. Yeah. So look, the, the lowest is in fact now. Now prior to, yes, Max, it is. It's 18%. The, the lowest prior to this year was 2011, and it was 3.31%. Yeah, Jerry's saying, I remember being in the high teens. I do too, as a kid. My, my, uh, my uncle was a builder and I remember interest rates got up into the 18% uh, uh, range and uh, he lost his, his business, his construction business. 
The historical average in the United States is 8%. The highest rate was uh, in 1981 at 18.63%. Now, you don't need to remember that exact amount. You could just simply say 18, between 18 and 19%, okay? The lowest rate was 3.3% in 2011 until this year. And currently the rate is at 2.8% and we've seen it lower than that. So what we know is that interest rates are at historic lows. Now, just to give you a perspective what that means, and I think this is important for you to understand, especially as you are working with buyers and sellers in today's marketplace. Just to give you some perspective, if you were to take a look at the 30 year fixed rate at 2.81%, on a $100,000 mortgage, that's roughly $450 per month. That's the mortgage payment. Now, if you were to take a look at that and compare that to 1981 at 18.63%, the payment would be roughly $1,600. You're talking about over three times as much in terms of the cost of money in 81 as compared today. Money today is exceptionally cheap. And as we compare it to the historical average, of course, it is exceptionally cheap, uh, again, still. So having said that, it's important that we have perspective on these things. So the other thing I wanna share with you is this. Uh, in 2019, there were approximately 6 million home sales. Now though the expectation at the beginning of this year, the end of last year was that we were gonna have about 4.85 million home sales. They expected that the number of homes that would sell this year would be less than, than last year. And in fact, that hasn't happened. What we're seeing uh, adjusted annually is that the expectation is that there will be about 6.85 million homes that will sell on a national level. Very interesting. So having said that, let's talk about some of the objections or questions that you might be getting, and then how you might be able to use some of this information, and maybe not, but depending upon the, the conversation and the question or the objection, how you could incorporate some of this information into the, uh, to the conversation. So if someone were asking the question, and I, I've gotten this one a couple of times recently as I'm uh, talking with agents, uh, where uh, buyers and sellers are asking this question, should we buy right now or should we sell right now? And I guess my question for you would be, what would you say? Is the answer yes or no? Just I, I want to hear from some of you. Would you say yes or no? And be careful because it might be a trick question. Rick Bentley says yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Marissa says yes, buy now. Okay. All right, I get it. Yeah, of course the answer is yes. But, here, but here's how I would respond to that. If you were to ask me as a buyer or, or a seller, should we buy right now or should we sell right now? M my conversation with you is simply going to be, look, my advice to you is that, it, well, let, let's just, just do the role play. It's best to just do it that way. That way you can just listen to me say it, this will be recorded and you can go back and watch it. So if you were to ask me, John, should we buy right now? I would say, you know, that's a great question. And the fact is that, after being in the business for nearly 30 years, what I have learned is this, that it is best not to try to predict or time the market because there've been so many times in the last 30 years where I have, uh, I have observed the so-called experts get it wrong and nobody really understand where the market was going. A great example was 2011. Nobody expected that the market was gonna crash to the extent that it did or that it was gonna take as many years as it did to recover. Right. And then just fast forward to 2020. Think about it. In 2020, nobody expected the, uh, the coronavirus uh, or COVID. Right. And as we actually got into the pandemic, of course, the expectation was that real estate sales were going to plummet. And this was going to be horrific for the real estate market. And yet here we are today with home prices reaching all time highs and homes getting multiple offers. These two scenarios teach me that we should never try to predict the market. So Mr. Uh, buyer, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, or Mr. and Mrs. Seller, my answer to you is this. I would always suggest that you decide to buy a home or sell a home based upon your personal circumstances. Does it make sense for you personally to buy or sell a home? 
So my question for you is this, does it make sense for you to buy or sell a home in today's marketplace? And then give them a chance to actually answer the question. See, now I know that isn't a one sentence succinct answer to the question, but I, I wanted to break it down for you. And then, so you have that information. Now what I will do is I'm gonna ask the question again, and then I'm gonna give it in a very succinct way, okay? So John, we're uncertain as to whether we should be buying a home in today's market. You know what, that is a great question. You know, I get that question asked a lot, especially in today's market. And what I've learned over my years in the business is it's best not to try to time the market because people don't have a crystal ball. 2011, people didn't expect that the market would hit the trough that it hit. And this year, nobody expected that we would be, would be in a pandemic. It is difficult to predict the future. So my advice to you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, is to simply decide to buy a home based upon your personal circumstances. Does it make sense for you to buy or sell a home in today's marketplace? Well, let me just tell you what we already know. What we do know is that interest rates are at an all-time low. Money is cheaper than it's ever been. And as a result, your ability to afford a, a, a mortgage, at least from the standpoint of the cost of money, is lower than it has ever have been. So would you like to buy a historically low mortgage rate at this point and go out and purchase a home? And of course their answer is going to be, well, yes, or it should be. And if they have additional questions, of course you can address that. But again, you're just simply giving them perspective. We're not speculating on what we don't know. We're just merely talking about what we do know and giving them some perspective on the fact is that there has been time in the history of the real estate market that people did not predict the direction that the market was going. Don't try to time the market. After 30 years in the business, guys and gals, the lesson that I have learned is that nobody knows actually the direction the market is going to go. So we merely have to decide what we're going to do based upon what we know today and whether it makes sense based upon our personal circumstances. And the truth is that people buy and sell real estate for all sorts of reasons. They buy and sell because of divorce. They buy and sell because uh, they are uh, their family is expanding, their family is contracting, they're empty nesters now, there are job transfers, there's uh, financial issues, there are all sorts of reasons. So the answer to that question is, I would tell you to buy or sell in today's market based upon your personal circumstances, but then give them perspective on what's actually happening in the market. So if it's a seller asking the question, the seller says, well, I don't know that I wanna sell because it may be difficult for me to find, a, to find a home. My response to that would be, you're right. It is actually a challenge to find a home in today's marketplace. And yet what we know is that sellers are. Here's the good news, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. The fact is that you can sell your home at historic highs today. And when it comes time to buy, to purchase your home and finance it at historic in low interest rates. So if you're concerned about finding a home, we have a couple of options. Your first option would be to make the sale of your home contingent upon a replacement home. That's one option or another option, which makes it a, a whole lot easier and allows your home to sell very quickly would be to sell your home and then to rent a home for a period of time so you don't feel any pressure. And actually this gives you a competitive advantage. When you go out to make an offer on a home, when inventories are so low, if you have all of your cash in a bank and you don't have to worry about uh, getting financing and you're paying cash or you're putting a significant amount down and your financing is already in place, it's going to give you a competitive advantage against buyers who have a home to sell or who don't have as much money as a down payment as you do uh, or have to worry about getting a home sold. So my question for you is, would you like to take advantage of those circumstances and actually get your home sold for top dollar in today's marketplace? So those would be the two conversations that I would have with people who ask the question, should I buy right now or should I sell right now? Now, the next question that, uh, that oftentimes I hear in today's marketplace uh, in Utah and California is that the other agent said that they were going to list my home for a discounted commission. And I'm assuming that especially in today's marketplace, guys and gals, that because homes are selling relatively quickly that you're getting that more often. Is that not correct? That was not a rhetorical question. I need somebody to respond in the chat line. Thank you, John. Yes. If you're not noticing that, the fact is, yes, Jerry, that, that's what I was looking for. You're seeing a lot more of it because sellers think, well, it's easy to get a home sold in today's marketplace. And is it easier overall? 
Yes, it is, no question, but it still takes a professional. But, but here's the thing that, uh, that I would say to you is that we've got to, again, give people perspective. Look, perspective is such a powerful thing. Perspective is knowledge, it's information. And with knowledge and information, people can take better decisions. Your prospects, your sellers in particular, in this case, need to take better decisions. They have a lot at stake. They have equity that they have accumulated over the course of years, in some cases, decades. It's important that they take the right decision to protect, to protect it, to preserve it. So when, when, it, when, quite frankly, in my opinion, an unprofessional agent comes to them and says that they are going to list their home at a discounted commission, the, the question is, how do we as professionals compete with that? Do we simply agree to match that commission? And I hope your answer is no. I hope your answer is no. I give a, a, a better presentation and I handle that objection effectively so that I'm not having to discount my commissions and compete with the discount agents and brokers. Look, guys and gals, I remember when I got into real estate in 1993. I remember a company by the name of Help You Sell was relatively new in the market. They were probably in the market for about five years at that point, maybe not quite that long. But I remember they were all the talk in the traditional broker market, you know, the, the Century 21s, the Coldwell Bankers, uh, Prudential back in that day, the Remaxes. They were all worried because this new company, Help You Sell, was coming in and offering discounted commissions. And they just knew that this spelled the end to the traditional brokerage model. Well, what is interesting is I don't, I can't recall the last time that I saw a Help You Sell sign. That model is not new. This model of discount commissions is not new. I mean, the modern iteration or versions of that, you know, purple bricks um, and uh, in, in uh, Utah, uh, you know, um, equity, th th there are all sorts of companies out there that are offering discounted commissions. That is not new. It will continue to happen. The real question is, how do you handle that particular conversation? Well, you've got to give the seller some perspective. So here's the perspective that I would give before I give the before I handle the objection. This is the perspective that I would give. What I'm going to challenge you to do is this. I want you to take a look at your historical list to sales price ratio. So take a look at all of the listings that you've taken in your career. And for some of you, you, you know, Brenda Lee's on this, this uh, uh, Zoomcast right now, and she's thinking, I am not gonna go back 30 years. Well, you don't have to, but go back the last five years, 10 years, whatever, and take a look at your historical average for listings, your original list price to the sales price. Now, the reason I'm starting up here, original list price to down here, sales price, is what you're gonna find is in the marketplace, homes are typically listed at 100%, and then they sell at some amount less than 100%. So one of the things that you want to do is you want to discover what that is in your particular market. What you'll find in most cases is the original list price at 100% and then the actual sales price is usually somewhere between 94 and 95% of the original list price. So then all you have to do is take a look at your listings that you've taken over the last year, two years, three years, whatever it is, however far you want to go back and see what your uh, original list price to sales price ratio is. I have many agents that I've had taken have had taken them through this process, and many of them have an original list to sales price ratio that is greater than a hundred percent. But even if it's not, what you're going to find in most cases is that your original list price to sales price ratio is going to be higher than the historical average. In fact, what you're going to find in most cases, unless you're a discount agent who just simply lists homes at discount and whatever uh, price that the seller wants, what you're gonna find is that your uh, final sales price average is greater than the average in the marketplace. And what you're gonna find is that that difference is actually greater than the discount that the discount agent is offering to your potential seller. Does that make sense? So they're saying to the seller, well, we're going to list the home at 4% for you, whereas the other agent is going to charge 7 or 6%, whatever your commission is, and we're going to save you money. 
Well, the challenge is it may look like that up front, but when you go through the entire process and you take a look at what that discount agent typically gets at the end of the process, they're selling the seller's home at a discount and the seller's losing a lot of money, but the seller doesn't see that because that's not the conversation that the agent has with them. They just talk about the commission. So I challenge you to take a look at what your original list, the sales price ratio is, come up with that percentage. And then what you should do is compare that to some discount uh, agencies or agents within the marketplace and see where you are actually different in terms of that ratio. And what you're gonna find is gonna be very surprising. Every agent, guys and gals, that I have taken through this process, it has blown their mind how higher their average list to sales price ratio is as compared to the market average and as they looked at specific agents who are consistently discounting their commissions. So if a seller said to me, well, the other agent said they were gonna discount my commission, I would just simply respond by saying this, you know, it's so interesting, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I hear that a lot, especially in today's marketplace. So my question for you is this, did they have a conversation with you about uh, original list to sales price ratios? Well, no, they didn't, what are you talking about? Well, here's the truth. The fact is that an agent who comes in and discounts their commission will just simply list the home and hope that it sells. And historically, what happens in that case is that homes are sold at a discount. Let me show you what I mean. See, when I list a home, I list a home at market value. And when I list a home at market value, typically what happens is we generate a lot of interest and oftentimes we get multiple offers. And especially in today's marketplace, that is what is happening. And so when you list with me on average, you actually net more money on your home, even though my commission is X, whether it's 7%, 6%, whatever it is, as compared to the discount agent at 4%. Let me show you what I mean. When I list a home on average, it sells for X percentage. So in this case, I'm just gonna say it's 99%, okay? So my historical average of list to sales price ratio is 99%. In other words, my homes sell within 99% of the original list price, okay? So my homes sell at 99% of the original list price. Let me show you what happens in the marketplace as a general statement. The, the average home, of course, is listed at 100% of its original list price. And if you take a look at what the average home sells for, historically, it sells for 94%. So the fact is the difference between listing with me and listing with a discount agent is not the 6% that I charge versus the 4% that they charge and you making 2% more on your home. The difference is that when you list with me, you, on average, you get 99% of the list price. And when you list with them, you get 94%. Well, that difference there is 5%. So even though you think you're saving 2% on the front end, the fact is you're losing 3% on the back end because of that 5% difference. Does that make sense? Well, gosh, I never looked at it that way. Well, and I appreciate the fact that you didn't because discount agents are not going to point out that fact because of course it's the ugly truth. So my question for you is this, would you like to sell your home for top dollar, preserve your uh, equity and make certain that you have as much money as possible to go out and purchase your next home? And then of the course their answer is gonna be, well, yes, that would be great. And then you're simply going to move forward. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, one more thing, actually, let me see if we can get through two. I'll, I'll do at least one, um, possibly two. So the other, the other thing that we see oftentimes is that the seller wants to list the home high, okay? So they want to list at a price that is higher than what you believe it's going to sell for. Now, historically, that is a trickier situation than in today's market because there's a lot more room for error in today's marketplace than there is in an average market. However, Having said that, what I would say, my response to that would, would simply be this. Assuming that their price is within some realm of reasonability, right? Let's say that the home is a $700,000 home and they want to list it for $750,000. Am I going to list a home that I believe is at $700,000 for $750,000 in a historical market? Not in today's market, but in historical market. My answer for you is going to be yes, if I cannot convince the seller to list at the right price, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm simply going to say to the seller, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, the fact is that you have owned this home and you've worked very hard to build your equity. And the last thing that I want to do is make you feel like you're leaving any equity on the table. So therefore, 
what I would suggest that we do is this. Let's list at your price, even though the work that we did together here suggests that your home is worth $700,000. Let's list it at your price for two weeks. And I'm going to do everything that I normally do to actively market your home and make certain that the world is aware of your home. And if in the first two weeks we don't get an offer on your home, then we need to reduce your home to the price that this analysis that we just went through suggests. So can I get your commitment that if I do my best efforts, knowing that I get paid my commission uh, and make more money when your home sells for more, to push and, and, and market your home to the highest degree possible for the next two weeks, and if it doesn't get an offer, that we're going to reduce the price of the home to the $700,000. And they're either going to say yes or no. And if they say no, then my I'm left with this decision. I either have to walk away or agree to list the home at that price. Now, having said that, I can tell you as much as I think that I know about values, and especially in today's marketplace, the fact is what I find is that oftentimes there is more elasticity or there's more room for the price. And so therefore, guys and gals, don't miss out on an opportunity to list a home, right? Just simply because you have this hard and fast rule that you're not going to list it at, uh, at a price that's different from the, uh, the, uh, the CMA, all right? Uh, the final thing is this, the question of why should we choose to work with you? If a seller or buyer doesn't ask that question of you directly, the fact is that they are thinking, why should we choose to work with you? My question for you is, do you have an answer for that? My belief is that you should absolutely have a competent answer to that question. Why should we choose to work with you? So the challenge that I'm going to give you is to come up with some very concrete reasons as to why a seller should choose to work with you versus your competition. Let me give you some suggestions as what you might incorporate into that. Just simply talk about the number of years that you've been in the business. You could talk about the brand that you are with, right? Century 21, over 130,000 agents worldwide with thousands of offices worldwide, with over a thousand in China, nearly a thousand in, in, in France, the, the number one most recognized brand in the world. The fact that your company sells around 9,000 homes every year, over $3 billion of real estate sold in multiple states, right? You could talk about your original list to sales price ratio. You could talk about the fact that you sell X number of homes a year. For a lot of agents, they'll say, well, I only sell 12 homes a year or, you know, I, I only sell, you know, 15 homes a year. I don't sell 50 or 100 like a, a lot of agents or some of the agents that I'm competing with. So don't look at it that way. Break it down differently. The fact is the average agent sells between two or three. Remember what I said in the beginning, guys and gals, and this is the point of this particular uh, question or objection handler. Why should we choose to work with you? The most important thing is not what you say. It is the way in which you say it. See, if you're an agent who sells eight to 12 homes a year, then what I would suggest that you do is refer back to the fact that the average agent sells between two or three. And you, if you're selling 12 a year, you're, you're averaging one home a, a month. You're selling a home every 30 days. If a seller has one home to sell and you can sell a home every 30 days, are they not in good hands with you? And the answer is yes, they are. So if a seller were to ask me and I were an agent that sold 12 homes a year and they asked me, why should we choose to work with you versus the competition? I'm gonna say, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that is such a great question. And I get very few times where sellers ask me that. So I'm so excited that you asked me that question. The reason you should choose to work with me is because the average agent, I don't know if you know this, just take a guess. How many do you think the average agent sells on, a, uh, on an annual basis? Well, John, we don't know. It's scary. The average agent sells between two and three homes a year. They're lucky if they can sell a home every quarter. The average agent is literally selling less than one home every quarter. And those are the producing agents. The good news is <clears throat> that I work with a lot of buyers and sellers and every 30 days I am selling a home. And I guess my question for you is how many homes do you need to sell? Well, we just need to sell ours. Well, great. Knowing the fact that I sell a home every 30 days, it seems like we ought to be working together. So you're ready to get started? Yep, we're ready to get started. Great. <clears throat> Look, it really doesn't matter what you cite. The most important thing that I just did there is that I gave a confident answer to the question. So come up with your confident 
answers as to why they should choose to work with you. If you're relatively new in the business and you don't have a lot of production, then talk about your process. Talk about the fact that you're an active agent. See, there are two types of agents in the marketplace. There are passive agents and there are active agents. See, you're an active agent. You get up, you follow a schedule, you show up to the office early, you prospect, you pr proactively reach out to people trying to match buyers and sellers together. You're not waiting passively for people to come to you in hopes that they're looking to buy or sell real estate. That is a key difference between you and the competition. Let your prospects know that you're an active agent. Do you have a process, a protocol that's proven? You follow a process that allows your company to sell 9,000 homes a year. That is a proven plan. Follow the process, lean on the process, derive your confidence on the fact that you have a proven process and that if you follow it and you present that to the sellers, right, then you can get their home sold. Let me just go back to the, the statement that I made in the very beginning. The best objection handler is a great presentation. And the best way to give a great presentation is to practice it and be prepared. Being practiced and prepared leads to confidence. And confidence is the number one value that you can offer your clients or your potential clients because they are nervous. In any market, they are nervous, especially in today's market with everything that's going on with COVID and the world the way that it is, they are nervous. They need someone who can hand them what they need, which is confidence in their ability to help them get what it is that they want. Hey, guys and gals, hopefully this was helpful. I enjoyed having the conversation with you. Let's finish.